Well, um, welcome everyone to this this joint event of the Social Impact Management Network Australia and the Australian Evaluation Society, SIMNA and AES. Um, before we we um, we proceed, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional lands on um, which uh, where I am, um, which is in in Brisbane um, or Minjin, um, and the traditional lands here um, where the where the traditional owners were the Jagera and the Turbul people. Um, um, thank you all for joining us today. My name is Rebecca Roebuck. I'm a, a social impact advisor um, based based here in Brisbane. Um, and I've got the joy of being on the organising committees for, for both SIMNA and the AES here in, in Queensland. Um, the idea of today is really simple. Um, what we wanted to do um, was really just to share some local impact tools and platforms um, that can be used for social impact measurement that have been homegrown here, here in Queensland. Um, and really just an opportunity for practitioners, either social impact or evaluators to find out more about um, some of the local products that are that are on offer. Um, and based on we've had uh, a really, really great response to today's event. Um, so I think there's a lot of interest out there to find out more about, about the local impact measurement tools and platforms that, that do exist. Um, so we've invited three presenters today to, um, to share their Queensland grown in social impact measurement um, tools and platforms. Um, and that's Sarah Mack from Folktale, um, who's also joined by Mel, Mel Harwin, um, Josh Murchie from Little Phil, and um, Luke Everett from, from Torch. Um, so just, I just wanted to pause here to make sure we've let everyone into the waiting room, which we have, um, and also just to acknowledge too, we are recording today's um, event as well, um, which hopefully you would have, would have received an alert as you, as you logged in. Um, the format today is going to be um, essentially each of each of the presenters will talk about their um, their platform or their tool. Um, there'll be an opportunity for you to, to ask any questions um, of them before we move on to the next presenter. Um, we will have some Q and A at the end as well um, across um, because we do have a large group that's attending. Um, if if I could ask everyone to please um, put any questions that you think of during the presentations into chat. Um, and we'll we'll manage the um, the questions um, so that we can, we can obviously coordinate that and make sure discussion runs runs really smoothly. Um, and um, the other thing, just is ever if you can stay on mute as well while um, while presenters are, are talking, um, and um, and obviously we'll take you off mute if you wanted to ask a question directly. Um, but if you can use the chunk fun chat chat function, that would be really good. Um, so. Um, I'm just, I will put in the, the chat as well, a link to each of our presenters' websites, um, as well as their LinkedIn profiles. Um, both Sarah, Josh and Luke and Mel are really happy for you to contact them after the session today as well, if you have any other questions um, or if you'd like to talk directly to them about how um, they might be able to help your, your impact measurement. Um, so um, without further ado, let me properly introduce um, each of our presenters and then I'll throw to them just to, um, in one or two sentences, explain what their, their impact measurement platform tool is. Um, and then we'll, we'll kick off with Sarah um, presenting about Folktale. Um, so each of our presenters today, um, Sarah Mack from Folktale is gonna be our first presenter. Um, so Sarah is a passionate entrepreneur driving change through real stories. Um, she's the co-founder and CEO of Folktale, um, which is a technology platform with a mission to transform how organisations globally approach storytelling in order to monitor, evaluate and communicate their ongoing impact. Sarah's career spans public health, global development, filmmaking and technology. She's shifting how communities, programs and donors connect their hearts and mind through the power of story. Joining Sarah to talk about Folktale is Mel Harwin. Mel is the head of stories at Folktale and she comes from a background in social impact measurement and evaluation. Um, she was the inaugural head of, of impact at um, Global Sisters and led their impact management um, function between 2018 and 2020, which went on to win a SIMNA Innovation Award in, in 2022. Um, so I'm I won't throw to Sarah and Melda to speak just yet, um, but Sarah, did you want to maybe just in one or two sentences explain what Folktale is? Thanks, Rebecca. Can everyone hear me okay? Wonderful. Um, so Folktale is a technology platform and our goal is to collect qualitative data through video in the form of stories. So that is the 
high level one liner. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Um, and I'd like to now introduce our second presenter, who will be Josh Murchie from Little Phil. Um, Josh co founded Little Phil, which is short for Little Philanthropist. Um, it's a micro philanthropy fundraising platform for non, -pro non profits. Um, he did this while he was studying his Masters of IT at Griffith University, um, and he's the current CEO. Josh has been a fellow of the Griffith University Unis Centre for Social Enterprise. He was the Australian Student Volunteer of the Year in 2017-2018. He's also the Gold Coast Young Entrepreneur of the Year and Griffith University's Young Outstanding Alumni of the Year for uh, 2023. Josh and the Little Phil team have won a number of innovation awards and have been featured at tech conferences in Asia, North America and Europe. Um, Josh, would you like to, um, in one or two sentences, just introduce Little Phil to us? Thanks, Rebecca. So Little Phil, we're connecting people, businesses and brands more directly with charities, causes and beneficiaries. So making the process more transparent, engaging and lowering overheads. Great. Thanks, Josh. Um, and finally, but certainly not least, um, our third presenter will be Luke Everett from Torch. Um, Luke is also an IT professional um, and he spent um, the last 15 years working in international development with teams from DFAT, the UK Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office and USAID. Um, after working with teams to design and implement, implement information systems for stakeholder reporting, um, I think he learned some lessons. So he started Project IO with some colleagues to improve impact measurement and stakeholder engagement. Um, and the result of which has been um, Torch. Uh, so Luke, would you like to just very, very briefly um, introduce Torch to us? Sure. So Torch is an impact management platform um, that's designed to take the, the drudgery and the manual uh, processes out of uh, impact measurement and uh, yeah, empower teams to actually get that data out in front of people instead of uh, having it in silos and, and just using it for reporting and stuff like that. So that's what we do. So I think that'll be of interest to a lot of people here who <laughs> do a lot of work in theory of change and program logic. Um, great. Well, um, thank you again to all of our presenters for joining us today. Um, I'd like to now invite Sarah to kick us off with, um, um, I guess, a, a deep dive into, into Folktale. Um, as I mentioned, if you can, any questions for Sarah as she's going through, if you can please put them in the chat. And if you can just note that they're questions for Sarah as well, so we don't get them confused, <laughs> confused later on. Um, and um, I'll hand over to Sarah. Thanks, Rebecca. And thank you for the introduction as well. Um, so before I start, I've just done a screen share of our presentation, confirming with a couple of hands up that you're able to see it okay. Amazing. Um, so we've got 15 minutes to talk about folktale, and there's quite a lot to talk about. So I guess thinking about the outcome in mind, um, we're not going to go into a deep dive on all of the different features that folktale can do. But today it's about imagining if you wanted to potentially approach and use folktale as a platform, as potentially a method or approach as part of methodology, what are some of the things that you might want to consider? So we're just going to talk about that very quickly as well. And so then Amel also will be joining me midway through in some of the presentation. Now, um, this is our website. And I think Rebecca mentioned that she'll also post it on the chat. But for very, very quickly, um, if you're interested in having a bit of a play on the platform, um, at the very right hand side of our platform, there's a button called Get Started. And there you're able to um, sign up for your very free workspace to be able to like in, have a little bit of a play as to all of the different features and roles that you might be able to use within Folktale as well. So um, quickly, that is just one of the things that you can have a play with whilst I'm going through the presentation. So we're going to talk about storytelling and it's without saying that I think it's been a really big conversation in the last couple of years, more broadly about the power of storytelling and what it means for us as practitioners. So stories of the way is the language that we use to understand the world. And more importantly, I guess, for us at Folktale, we believe that in order to achieve a more equity focused, culturally responsive and participatory evaluation, and impact measurement practice, we need to enable communities to evaluate their voices from where they are. And then what we believe here is also one of the most effective ways of achieving this is through the use of storytelling. Because stories are a powerful means of expressing our lived experiences, conveying identities while promoting understanding. 
And also through storytelling, individuals and communities can reflect on their experiences, make sense of them, and then ultimately create meaning as well. And so one of the things that we think about here is, okay, well, what do we mean by stories, right? So effectively stories is a retelling and telling of information as told by different stakeholders. And so when we break down the different uses of story at Folktale, we just wanted to break them into three components. So stories can be used for data in terms of qualitative data, engaging teams, programs, communities. And in our platform, we have different types of features and, and including um, being able to set and build templates against any of your methodologies to be able to code content, map themes and leverage lean and real time qualitative data to uncover hidden insights or evaluate and measure impact. In addition, the importance of stories for sharing. So Folktale puts the power of storytelling in the palm of everyone's hands. Because we are a technology platform, we have the ability to scale. It enables individuals to share their stories in their own ways without third party intervention. Um, authentic participant led storytelling that fosters connections and inspires positive change. And finally, the importance of connection through story. It's a lot more effective beyond numbers. People remember stories. Um, it's really hard to actually remember numbers. And so what? Why do they matter? Particularly in the work that we do. And so stories speak to the heart to move the mind. They inspire others, tell a shared organizational story through the many stories. And we also, through Folktale, the goal is fostering connections by allowing storytellers to share their experiences, motivating supporters and donors. So really quickly, three kind of thematics around how we define a story at Folktale. Now, the world has changed. The world is here right now. And one of the things that we wanted to talk about as well is the medium in which we are actually connecting through story. And the medium itself is through video. And so if our intent is stories, the approach that we're taking through qualitative data is how do we actually scale it um, through the process of um, video? So we have three main things that are happening, including like market trends. There's a rise of mobile technology globally. There's a dominance and effectiveness as, of video as a medium, and also the rise of this conversation around artificial intelligence. So those are really three big things happening around the world and we can't shy away from them. And there's um, some interesting stats here that talk about the effectiveness of video, and these stats are taken from Cisco. And so it talks about the effectiveness of video in terms of watching something rather than reading text, that people would rather learn via video, 72%. And also the world's traffic, the internet traffic, 80%, if not more, is dominated by video. So this is really here and now the way that we're engaging. Now, very quickly with the end in mind, if we do incorporate video into our impact measurement practices, a really quick case study is um, we do work with a lot of DFAT funded programs. And so previously before Folktale, without using Folktale, they used to write traditional reports. And so anecdotally, we do have this information that at DFAT, when they received this report, the program um, acknowledged that only two out of 22 people from DFAT read that report. Now working with Folktale, incorporating the use of video as a complementary part of the reporting process, rather than two of 22 reading the report, actually 17 of 22 actually watched the video, 17 rather than two. And also all of the innovations highlighted in that video got picked up by DFAT and were taken to scale and implemented. It opened their eyes to the things they wanted to look for in the report. So that's really quite a, a really important anecdote to suggest that this platform is not solely for the individual sharing their story. It, there is something in a particular role for the different parts and the different kind of stakeholders that engage with the listening, collecting, reviewing and sharing of stories as well. So really quickly, what is Folktale? I really quickly mentioned that it's a qualitative data platform for the collection of video. So as a technology platform, we're really user friendly and we streamline how you're able to collect um, effectively video and qualitative data. Um, there's a whole bunch of different ways that we can do it, but for the purposes of today, there you're able to collect, code, translate, securely manage your data in order to evaluate, adapt and learn, as well as rapidly share authentic program and community stories. There's this level of inclusivity because of the ability to, depending on your workflow, be able to um, launch this as part of your program. 
Now, as I mentioned before, we are a method or approach that can be incorporated into your methodology. And we're also not an out of the box solution. It does take a couple of months for your different stakeholders to understand the role that they play and how they can utilize folktale for their activity. So that means that we do require some training for the technology components to it, but also how you integrate it into your program workflow for all of your different stakeholders. And then also we have designed this with the sector in mind. So we do have different flows for environments that have little to no connectivity, that don't have technology equipment, but also how do we actually scale this so that more inclusive voices can participate in the sharing of stories. And so this participant this participatory approach through video storytelling is where individuals can show and tell their stories um, that matter to them. So very quickly here, these are just some of the things on the Folktale platform that you can do. So in there, depending on which role you play, you're able to invite stories through designed templates. So templates there are really about keeping it super simple for contributors to be able to contribute their story. So it's about telling and showing and making it super simple to um, share the story. And we do the rest in terms of the process and all of the kind of putting it together into something that's engaging and coherent. On the platform, as a closed platform, we're able to watch, learn, and then have a couple of ways to summarize and then share it back to the key informants that matter most. And most important as well, um, we do have different flows for translations globally, informed consent, and privacy and data security as well. Um, these are just some of the places as a new company that we have engaged with globally. And what's important here is that we have worked in some of the most uh, remote environments in the world. And that's important for us because the more that we're able to use technology as an enabler, for you to be able to use this as part of your workflow, the better. Because naturally here, um, it's a faster, easier, more cost-effective way for you to be able to incorporate the collection of qualitative data through video into your workflow as well. Now, very quickly, because of today's timing, we don't have time to show you what particular outcomes look like. But imagine if you wanted to, I guess, quickly see what was happening with a community and someone's going to visit that particular community. You're able to grab a template and you're able to follow into, let's say, a five-shot template. Tell me what's happening, show me the environment, tell me why it matters, show me the people that are involved. In all of that, you just focus on completing all of those individual shots. Folktale magically stitches it together and then submits it back to your, your library, no matter where you're based as well. Oh, give me a bit. I'm gonna hand it over to Mel because now we're gonna talk about making it relevant based on a few examples that we have worked with from programs. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay, thanks. Um, hi everyone, I am joining from Duck and Young Country on the central coast of New South Wales. So I'm not technically Queensland, but um, I'm supporting Sarah. Uh, yeah, so my background is in mainly international development um, and evaluation and impact measurement. Um, so I just wanted to share something, I guess it's a problem that um, Folktale is helping solve. Uh, this is a case study from an Australian based um, NGO working across uh, 40 local partners um, in 20 countries with over 60 projects. And I think I just wanted to share this case study because it's probably um, a traditional but consistent way that data has been collected um, for monitoring evaluation and impact. Um, and it raises some kind of issues that people are facing at the moment. So um, some desk-based research basically of, of the processes that were being used was that it was taking over six months from report collection or story collection to review and reporting or feedback um, on those reports. Uh, so this was um, a, quali a qualitative sort of monitoring evaluation cycle. Um, and you'll see here the time and process that the journey this sort of story was taking was translated um, over, yeah, I think, yeah, so five times was the average translation um, that happened from, you know, diverse language groups um, in remote parts of in communities to a, maybe a field officer or then to a head office, then to an Australian-based office, then to maybe DFAT. There was sort of this changing of hands happening. So in that process, 
story is being translated, language is being translated, but there's also subjectivity um, and the, the rigour around the data is getting and lost um, in that process. So what happens is um, what we're finding was from field to inbox, it was a six-month time lapse. The, the changing of hands um, meant that the data wasn't as quality you know, the quality of the data was lost, um, but also the ethics around data sovereignty, consent were being confused. And then by the, the purpose of using this not only for qualitative data, but for um, storytelling, engaging marketing and comms um, teams and donors, they, the trouble was that 70% of them were unable to be used because they'd misplaced consent or the quality wasn't there for dual purposes. Um, and so I just wanted to show this as a case study of a before scenario um, where Folktale kind of was able to come and streamline a process and those points of um, collection, management, um, security, and then reporting were streamlined into kind of three to five steps. Um, Sarah, can you just move on to the next slide? Um, and so how how or where would you be thinking about um, designing this boat tail? Um, so at the bottom here, um, you'll see these are kind of your steps to m and &E, um, plan development that are pretty generic, but you'd probably all recognise that identified identification piece where you're identifying the audience of your data collection, the purpose, the questions you want answered, um, the indicators or metrics you're mapping to, and uh, choosing your tools or methods or data sources. So at this point, you have the ability to kind of use the Folktale platform to select the appropriate templates, um, set up the timing of reporting for your that's um, aligned with your cycle, reporting cycles or data collection cycles, um, and then begin to implement from the design sort of activation phase of your M&E planning. Um, and so from there, it goes through the process of creating um, stories that are participant led. Um, and so your data collectors are either uh, individuals themselves or reporters, field reporters on their behalf. Um, and at that point, you're collecting, you can um, be theming the uh, templates that you're using and gaining consent uh, to start that coding and meaning making at the collection point. Um, and then obviously it's traveling in real time back to a dashboard, which is able to see what's coming in. And um, already with those predefined tags, you can, whether they're to SDGs that you're measuring to or different metrics, internal metrics, you're able to start to map story straight away um, to help with that analysis piece. Um, so next slide is, is this back to you or is it back to me? It's, it's back to me now very quickly. Thanks for that. Um, so in terms of, I guess, the platform itself, um, just as a reminder, what I guess Mel has just alluded to is that the platform itself is really quite simple in terms of its features. I think the biggest thing to consider is what role do you play and how do you integrate this as part of your particular role? So if you're there to select and implement, that say collect and invite the right stakeholders to contribute to qualitative data through video, then you would have a particular role and feature set. And then we do have the contributors, no matter where they're based, and it doesn't matter if they have connectivity or equipment, there's a way for them to be able to participate through the medium of video. And when we talk about the rich medium, again, here it's video, but also audio, photos, just the richness of what we're often showing and telling through this modality of qualitative video as well. And then finally, back onto the platform, as we mentioned, there's some capabilities around the dashboard to tag, share, and then to be able to make more analysis um, of the information that's captured as well. Um, what I wanted to also share very quickly before I go into the next slide is um, just because of the nature of this environment and the time that we had, um, I just wanted to quickly share another example here. Now, I've put it into the meeting chat because I've got two resources that I'm going to share. This is really quickly one of the DFAT programs that we work with. And so for the first 12 months, it took about took a while for everyone to understand the different roles and responsibilities that they um, that they um, had to play. And then ultimately from there, um, the m and &E team, as well as the communication team, work hand in hand to be able to use Folktale as a way to report back to DFAT. 
Um, that's great because now it, it's an easier way for partners to participate. It's more inclusive because now they're able to um, to be able to do it um, in a way that is, um, I guess, easy. And most importantly, it's also really engaging with all of the community members as well. The reasons why I'm sharing with you this link is because um, they created this Fotel Oscars, which is um, an intended benefit, which I thought was wonderful. They did this all themselves to celebrate all the different partners and programs. And as a result of the work that they're done, um, the, the, the participants also have more confidence in speaking and sharing um, in this way that otherwise they had not had this skill. So it's another form of building capacity with uh, more folks in your program and communities as well. Um, there is a question here very quickly, um, large amount edited through the platform to extract insights. Um, so I might just go through these afterwards. I'll finish this and then go back to those two questions. So thank you for that. So that's the first one. And then finally, very quickly before we wrap up, um, these are just some of the customers that we work with um, nationally and globally. And so really it's about finding that initial context, understanding that there are a lot of stories to be told. And it's not that we're solving for storytelling, we're actually solving for the process, the really difficult way of scaling and including participant voices. And so each of them naturally have different programs that we engage with and, um, and, and we're just getting started as well. Now, as I mentioned at the very start, um, I know this is super high level. We normally go through a bit more of the features and demo and stuff. And that's why I just wanted to call your attention to if you wanted to have a little sticky beak of the actual platform and play the different roles, feel free to get started found on the on the top right hand corner of our website. There's also a really quick 90 second video that's directly on our website that actually unpacks the entire flow of our platform today. I didn't wanna share that today because of connectivities everywhere. And I didn't think that experience would be as nice. Finally, two final slides is that Mel and I will be presenting at this year's AES conference. So if any of you are interested and or will be participating, um, please come by and say hello. It'd be great to um, put faces to names and also learn more about your programs that you are working across. So we've got one here that Mel and I are facilitating, the first one, harnessing the transformative power of participant-led storytelling for evaluation, there's a QR code there. And the second one is actually working in concert with one of our partners. So a lot of the impact that's been achieved, evaluating and monitoring sports programs in the Pacific. So it's the team up article that I've just shared with you. And then finally, I know that uh, Rebecca has already shared at the very beginning, but thank you for your time today. We'll go into the Q&A section. These are our QR codes for our LinkedIn, our emails. Reach out if you'd like to learn more and we can have a deeper dive into the actual capabilities of the platform itself. So I'm just looking at time, I think I'm up. So now, uh, Rebecca, I think we'll go into the Q&A time, eh? Great, thanks, Sarah. Um, and I have, I have the pleasure of catching up with Sarah every few months and always hearing what amazing stuff she's she's up to. Um, and uh, you can see just um, Folktale's been working on some really interesting stuff. Um, just having a look at the questions that have come through, um, Sarah, we've got one from um, Tassine. Um, what are the common challenges that come with video story collection? Would you uh, like to answer that? That's a really great question. And there are a lot of challenges and opportunities and we're constantly um, monitoring and improving the experience. Now, when we're thinking about um, video story collection, we have to think about the roles, right? So understanding, have we designed it with the right context in mind? So starting at the very beginning in the design phase of it, why are we doing it? Why does it matter? Why this approach? And is it gonna be effective for the communities or programs and stakeholders that we want to collect from? So those are just generally phase one. Does this actually meet the planned requirements of what you wanna do? Now, if we think about like, let's say those who are sharing their story or, you know, being able to like submit stories, we've got some challenges with regards to the technical side of things. So understanding basic things like shaky camera or um, I don't feel confident speaking to camera or I've not used technology before. This is difficult. So there are technical components to it, but also some ethical components. Am I safe to take out my equipment? Um, in an environment. Am I safe or am I putting others in jeopardy or at risk as well? You can see that we have thought about all of those things. It's by no means not perfect. We do have some kind of modules in what we call Folktale Academy. And so if you sign up for that um, workspace, 
you automatically get about 50 modules of Folktale Academy things. Everything from composition, audio, lighting, which then challenges the actual engagement of video collection, but also the things to consider as well, the ethics, safeguarding and consent process when you do collect those stories as well. Um, so what I'm trying to say is there are a lot of challenges, but naturally when you go through our platform, we try and streamline that, keep it as simple as possible so that when you are collecting stories, you know that our platform has security, privacy, consent in mind, and that at least it's a safe enclosed environment for you to be able to collect qualitative data through video at scale. Is that helpful? Just in terms of high level things that we're thinking about and um, do with our organizations as well. Right. Thanks, Sarah. Um, I'm just going to go through. I think um, Mel's been very kind and answered some of these in, in the chat. Um, but, um, but one of the questions, I suppose, from Mary, ja Mary Jane was if you could share a screenshot of the template um, yeah. and who owns the data once collected. Amazing. So in terms of templates themselves, um, I might go for the second one whilst I'm preparing this at the same sure. time. <laughs> When we talk about templates, I'm just going to go through very quickly and show you. Let's see. Bear with me. Here we go. Just going to share a screen. All right. So um, these are just some of the templates available on our platform, right? And so templates, again, are a combination of telling and showing shots. And this role in visibility is only available to those who have a particular job to be done. So let's say you're a program manager, you're a Merle, you know, you're a Merle officer. So here we've got some basics already ready to go, but they may not meet your requirements. So you can take a look at the getting started or let's say milestone ones. We've got a series of questions telling, uh, telling show, shots and showing shots. So here it's just a matter of reviewing all of the existing platform or existing templates available on our platform, getting you past the blank page. And then you're able to edit this template, modify it to make it more specific to your needs. You can also adjust it to any language of choice as well, given the programs and environments that you work within. And so this is an example of a couple of templates. And so what that looks like is if you looked at, let's say, field report template or goals and vision template, you can take this, you can modify it, and then what contributors see is a really simple bite-sized, complete the first shot, complete the second shot, complete the third shot. They only need to focus on completing the actual information and story. They don't have to worry about putting it together into something that's cohesive and engaging. We do all of that on our side. The technology has been built in a way that you get instantaneous kind of um, combination of shots put together. Is that helpful in terms of this? So this is just high level, just some of the templates available on our platform. And there's lots and lots. And you can also design your own templates. If you look at these and say, these aren't really feasible for me, I want to design something a bit more bespoke to my requirements as well. In terms of the, um, the IP and who owns the story, We've got different flows. Now, Folktale does not own any of the stories. So we've got two pathways. Now, let's say you're asking to collect stories from one of your employees. Naturally, if let's say you've got employee engagement and contracts, that will often supersede any of the, you know, um, in terms of the ownership of the um, stories themselves. So often the organization, depending on your own contracts, uh, those are the ones that um, would retain the IP. Now, if communities that are not associated with the organization do submit stories, they retain the right to their stories. However, the organization does get a license to use it for the intended purpose. So when you design it, you are, are being quite intentional to inform contributors, am I using it internally for purposes of impact measurement? Or am I using it externally? I'm gonna be using and broadcasting it more further. And so that consent flow is then realized and communicated with the appropriate parties, and they get to make the decision whether they wanna accept or decline that invitation. So different consent flows, depending on how you're using it as well. Right, thanks Sarah. There's, um, there's a, a, a few questions in the chat, but we, do, we will need to move on. But um, I think there's a quick one here that um, I think would be, be good if you could answer is, um, are the videos just one way? Um, is there an opportunity for interaction? Um, interaction is being built as we speak. So we are a te startup technology company and we're building feedback loops, community groups, and a whole bunch of micro communities as well. And the answer is yes, yes. Um, I think that's so important. And also remembering that contr contributions do not need to be simply with the communities or programs. 
anybody can contribute. All of us can contribute at any time. So really thinking about who needs to contribute and why. And so when you do understand the flow of our platform, it doesn't really matter who contributes as long as it's aligned with the context of why you're actually incorporating folktale as an approach into your methodology. So um, I hope that's helpful. Yeah, it was very helpful, Sarah. Um, well, thank you. Thank you so much for, for presenting about Folktale. And, and Mel, thank you as, as well. It was great, great to hear the, the case study or studies. And um, um, for those of you that if um, your questions haven't been answered in the chat yet, um, Sarah or Mel might answer them as we go through. But otherwise, we're going to have a bit of time at the end to, to finalise some questions and answers as well. Um, but yeah, thank you very much, Sarah and Mel. Um, um, just before I, I throw across to Josh, um, as a, this is a joint um, SIMNA and AES Queensland event, um, I just wanted to acknowledge our respective co-chairs for our different organising committees who, who have also joined the, the session. Um, for the, um, the SIMNA Queensland committee, um, we're co-chaired by David Jack and Rosa Hearn, um, who, are, who are both, both here. Um, and I'd also like to um, acknowledge Kim, Kim Abbey, um, who I think might have a different surname now. I think she might have got married um, since, since she was Kim Abbey, um, but who's also the, the co-convener of the Australian Evaluation Society Queensland Committee. Um, so thank you. Thank you for, for those people for supporting the event as well. Um, I'd now like to, um, to welcome Josh to talk about little, little Phil. Um, as um, as um, we mentioned earlier, um, to, um, Josh is the, um, the current CEO of Little Phil. Um, and he's a, uh, comes from a, an IT tech background. Um, so Josh, I, um, I've already introduced you before, so I won't, won't do that again. Um, and um, for those who are interested in finding out more about Josh or um, little Phil as he's speaking, um, I did put the link in the chat earlier as well. So you can, if you can go back through the chat, it'll be somewhere at the start, start somewhere. So over to you, Josh. Awesome. Thanks, Rebecca. And thanks for coming and listening, everybody. Let me just put this on full screen. Is that... All good. Yep. Great. Uh, so yeah, as mentioned at the start, Little Phil, short for Little Philanthropist, uh, we've been building out infrastructure to facilitate impact. Uh, so initially started around how we increase trust and transparency and engagement. That's moved a little bit more broader now to unlocking new and alternative streams of fundraising, uh, helping to reduce nonprofits overheads with uh, marketing and content kind of tools. And then I've designed this presentation to cater for a bit of a mixed audience, as it sounds like we had uh, quite a few nonprofits in the audience as well. Uh, so yeah, as mentioned, we've been working on Little Phil since 2017. So coming up to six, seven years now, um, we do quite a bit of work in emerging technologies. So in blockchain, AI, uh, and so on. I think this probably sums up for anyone that's in the nonprofit sector or, or working around those kind of technologies, a little bit of how it sits right now. So uh, there's not many solutions that make it quite simple for especially small to medium organizations. Um, everything's quite fragmented, uh, very challenging to kind of put a holistic digital solution together. That's where Little Phil kind of comes in to, to tidy that all up and make everyone's life a little bit more simple. But, and then from a visual perspective, this is ideally our goal. So how do we reduce overheads in costs and time for nonprofits? How do we increase tr transparency and maximize the impact at the end? Uh, we work across B2B and B2C, so business to business and business to consumer directly through our Little Phil platform. Um, the core stakeholders that we work with are obviously donors, philanthropists, nonprofit organizations uh, who then, you know, by way of being connected to distributing aid and so on, beneficiaries, uh, businesses and brands, and then more into the future, we're working around government and policymakers with data. So for a nonprofit, we've developed an all-in-one solution, which we refer to as Mission HQ. So how can you launch campaigns, educate uh, donors or potential donors and stakeholders about the work that you're doing, uh, close the loop? So a big thing that we see with the next generation is that they expect to, if you can order 
you know, a burger on Uber and track it all the way to your house? Why, if I donate, can I not have, you know, some kind of feedback loop of where my money's actually gone and been used and, and the impact it's created? Uh, I'll dive more into a demo. So I think it'll be a bit more powerful to show the platform actually functioning. So after this, I'll dive into more of a demo. Uh, another impact kind of tracking tool for nonprofits specifically would be around share link tracking. So a problem that some of the nonprofits that we work with uh, had brought up was oftentimes they'll have influencers, you know, ambassadors and so on for the organization. They struggle to get them to turn up to events to help with fundraising and so on. However, they're more than willing to be sharing, you know, campaigns and so on. So we've developed a tool that allows a charity in a couple of clicks to create a unique link for any campaign or any influencer, ambassador and so on, and then track click-throughs, track conversions and donations and so on. So I'll give a little demo of that after. From a donor perspective, we try to integrate all your impact into the one platform. So this is actually live data of my account uh, where you can see that if I make a donation directly through Little Phil on the platform, it'll show here in my impact. If I go to a nonprofit that's using or that's powered by Little Phil, so using our infrastructure, so Skur on the left is an example there. Again, it's going to show in my impact. If I go and make a purchase through a store that uses Shopify, so 4.2 million plus e-commerce stores, I'll be able to see that in my impact. Or if I receive giving credits from a, my employer, which I'll go into after this, again, we're trying to keep it all in the one interactive impact dashboard. Uh, so as I kind of just touched on there around employee credits, we've developed a very unique solution for companies to attract and retain employees and to be able to, I guess, kind of track from a data perspective insights around what causes their employees care about, have dynamic data around, you know, the use of funds. So an example there would be, let's say Westpac gives $10 million a year to CareFlight, but they disregard what their 33,000 employees care about. Our technology effectively allows them to come in and say, okay, Rebecca, as part of your remuneration, we give you a thousand bucks a year to donate to whatever you care about. So in a month, that can either be one lump sum or on a monthly basis, credits are automatically distributed to employees. As the employees donate, we're helping kind of bring more awareness, potential recurring donations from employees, but then also a lot of data for the companies and so on as well. Uh, and again, this kind of just touches on some of the key benefits around that. So obviously around CSR and um, if you're looking into triple bottom line reporting and so on, there's not a huge amount of solutions out there at the moment that really get as granular as what we can get. Um, and again, all your tax benefits and culture and, and so on. From a e-commerce perspective. So this is really a demonstration of our, what's referred to as an API. So our infrastructure effectively would allow anyone to build on top. So if they had their own idea on how they want to make an impact on nonprofits via financial donations and so on, they'd be able to tap into a verified database of nonprofits and basically just use our infrastructure. So bypassing the the whole process of, okay, I need to go and verify that this is a legitimate charity um, and, you know, set up accounts and facilitate the transaction or the uh, transactions of actual funding and so on. So with this, any store that's built on Shopify, so as I man mentioned, 4.2 million around the world can install our shop and support app. So in a few seconds, they can select one to three nonprofits and then either a percentage or a dollar amount per sale. Customer goes through checkout as per normal. Um, so there's no potential of drop-offs or losing the customer by trying to enforce a donation on the, on the end. Uh, but 
after the sale, a little pop up will come up and say, okay, thanks, Sarah. Here's the three charities we support. Which one would you like to give your $2 to? So uh, a really great way for brands to engage in giving back. And then also from a, a business perspective, you'd be looking at, well, if you were a savvy marketer in e-commerce, you'd be probably putting three very different nonprofits. So you get a bit more of an idea on the persona of your customers and so on. Uh, we work with some of the top uh, experts in the field across Australia. So we'll actually be releasing our 2023 state of the sector research report tomorrow. So we'll have another panel same time tomorrow. Uh, I'll put a link in the chat after this if anyone is interested and would like to attend. And I'm Rebecca, I'm happy to either go directly into demo and do questions after demo or vice versa. Yeah, I think we've just got a question in the chat from Karen, um, which might be mm -hmm. good for you to um, to address this before you go into demonstration. Um, and Karen was just asking where the impact data comes for each for each donation. Uh, so that's probably easier for me to show. You. I'll give you a demo. Right. <laughs> the answer in the demo. Perfect. Yep. So great question. We've tried to make the platform much more of a digital native experience. So if you imagine the stakeholders here, we're looking at a charity dashboard. So if I go and click over here, I'm actually looking at a live, this is a donor dashboard. I can come in here and choose any of the campaigns that I, I like. I can make a donation. As you can see up the top right there, I've got donation credits. So my employer gives me credits that I can use and I can either choose to use all of them or part credits and part card. I make the donation. So again, all live data. We've got our nice little feel good moment. So the, the fireworks going off, I can now click through and track my impact. So all of this is actually live data and live fundraising campaigns that are either completed or current. But if I click into them, I can see, okay, great. You know, this campaign that I donated to here, they exceeded their goal. Here's what it was for. The charities actually come back and put a picture of the hand washing station that they wanted to build with that funding. So we've closed the loop on, you know, building trust with a donor and so on. Uh, and then we can break that down by as flexible as we want. We've categorized it in the little fill platform as by category. So you can see here that my giving is much more tiered towards community, but we've also got the data around whether or not we want that to be aligned with the SDGs and so on. Um, up the top here, so you can see my total impact, network giving, is another unique feature of how we can enable people to make an impact, even if they didn't have the funding available to make an impact at the time. So basically what that means is if I was to share a link to one of these campaigns, it'll set up a unique link that's being tracked. And then I can go out to any of my network and say, you know what, I really want to help fund this playground. Um, share it around. If anyone's clicking through, I can see that. If anyone's making a donation, I can see that too. So it's a way to activate, you know, the community and especially younger students and so on who may really want to go out there and help kind of raise funds for something that they're passionate about, but they just don't have the financial means to, to do that. Um, and to answer your question, the charities would be uploading. So a message, a picture, so on. We're encouraging them to do that so that we can educate, you know, out of the 60,000 plus nonprofits in Australia, what it is you do <clears throat> and to, you know, build that trust and close the loop. So if we have a quick look from a, a charity perspective, we've got a really simple and easy to digest dashboard. So we can go into more detailed reports as well around donors, donation amounts, average donation values, et cetera. Um, but the share link tracking is probably the, 
one of the tools that a lot of nonprofits just don't really have access to. So an example would be here, I can choose whether I want to promote my nonprofit or promote a specific campaign I'm running. The type of uh, tracking that I'm doing. So am I working with an influencer? Am I doing a campaign through a blog or through Facebook or so on? And then we've left this part flexible enough so that if I wanted to, I can come in and uh, set my own kind of precedence around how I want the link to be set up. Once that's generated, I can now, so just to explain what I'm doing, I'm going to go to that link through a, a private browser, which will replicate a new user or donor going through. I'll replicate doing a, a donation through that link. So I've already got a card added. So within a couple of taps, I can make a donation. If I come back here now, I can now see that the donation's gone through, um, the channel and so on. So I would be able to focus more of my time and effort from an impact perspective on using the channels that are converting the best for me. Probably a little bit more of a marketing tool, but still quite powerful. Um, I think I'm getting pretty close to my time now, but happy to go back to answer any questions from here. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Josh. Every time I see this, I get more and more excited about it. Um, it looks so, I, I just really like how it looks really, really clean. I can see how it'd be really useful. Um, we've got some real curly questions. Um, that was my <laughs> warm up for you, Josh. <laughs> some curly questions in the correct Q&A, um, but some really good ones. Um, I'll go back to Karen because she's asked one of, about one of my favourite topics, which is um, which is about preventing impact washing. Um, and you touched a little bit about about this already, but, um, you know, is there a way of verifying, um, you know, how the money is actually being spent? Um, but, you know, our charity is doing what they say they're going to do with it. Yeah, great question. So um, on that, we've been developing some solutions around blockchain, which is the track and traceability of funding. To be honest, majority of nonprofits, especially in Australia, are barely at what's referred to as Web 2 yet. So trying to bring them up to Web 3, I think we're still a little way away. Um, the US is a little bit different, but in Australia at least, uh, that's what we're seeing. Um, to prevent impact washing, so ideally the platform is set up so that if you're launching a campaign, it's one, it's not to go and raise millions of dollars for a campaign. It's so that you can get the word out there about what your organization does, cut through the noise, because you're now competing not only against 60,000 registered in Australia, but millions around the world. So why does anyone know or why should they care about your organization? So, okay, great. It's your opportunity to have a little kind of billboard there. If you're not closing that feedback loop, so providing pictures and so on, then the donors that have come through there, the chance that they'll give to you again is much lower. So the whole system's designed around that closing of the loop um, and so on. From a, I think I can see another one in there around what impact means. An issue that we have kind of seen with some of the impact reporting, specifically in donation space, is that it can be biased. So an example there would be we work with two different charities. They both work with kids. One works with kids from, uh, so orphans from abandoned uh, drug addicts and prostitutes. The other's just disadvantaged children. So if you're looking into overheads on those two different charities and you're applying certain kind of methodologies on how you assess their use of funding, obviously the first one that's much more higher needs is not looking as great. Um, so some of the existing frameworks we don't believe are great or work in that respect. Um, yeah. Oh, you're on mute, I think. That's thanks, Josh. Um, and just a, another question there from Mary Jane as well, which is about the corporate giving. Um, can it be from the pre-tax salary um, rather than the organisation contribution per employee? 
Um, and then, yeah, a second question about um, overlaying with ticketing platforms like Humanitics and Eventbrite. Perfect. Um, yeah, they're definitely avenues that we're looking into at the moment. So anywhere where there's a transaction effectively could have impact or embed impact, and that percentage can then come straight through the, the infrastructure of the technology. Um, so yeah, 100%. At the moment, it's not hooked up, but definitely that's that's kind of where we're headed. Right. Thanks, Josh. Are there, um, just check and, um, oh, nice comment there from, from Rose, um, just that tech doesn't wash impact, people wash impact. Very true, Rose. Um, and that, yeah, thanks. Um, if anyone can't see Rose's um, uh, comment, please have a look at that. It's a very good point. Um, well, thank you so much, um, Josh. Um, as I mentioned before, Josh is sticking around. So if there's any further questions that you have, have for Josh, um, please, um, um, please feel free to keep them, putting them in, in the chat and um, there'll be an opportunity at the end. Um, and as I mentioned before to um, Josh's contact details and little Phil as well, uh, website link is in, in the chat. If you scroll all the way back, back to the, the start. So th thank you so much, uh, Josh. No and um, and Josh is very happy for people to get in contact contact with him as well if you want to talk specifically about um, about how this might, might work for your, your organisation and what you need to, to measure. Um, I'd like to now um, welcome uh, Luke Everett from from Torch. Um, and before before I do that, I again I keep forgetting to acknowledge people, but I also wanted to acknowledge Laura Glynn, who's the executive officer for Simna, um, who's a, who's my co-host for today, and who's doing a lot of work in, in the background. Um, so thank thank you very much, Laura Laura, for that. Um, so Luke, over to you, and um, we look forward to hearing about Torch. Great, thanks everyone for joining. I know I've spoken to some groups before but it's good also to sort of get a bit of a refresher so who are we um so the founding team for project AO I guess um came from a group of monitoring and evaluation uh and economists uh people working in information technology myself software development and then cybersecurity and IT governance. I think this is going to be an area where people have to be a lot more uh, knowledgeable and informed as we start working with these different governments in the field and that sort of thing. So we wanted to make sure that we had that, that experience, especially capturing sensitive data and those sorts of things. Um, we also mostly come from the international development background. So if a lot of that sort of uh, comes through, I know there's lots of domestic teams as well. Um, but that's sort of where, where things started. Uh, and really what we wanted to do was streamline and standardize the process for teams to initially build their theory of change. How can we sort of help teams implement the theory of change approach most effectively? Um, and then give some tools along that path to reduce the friction, to sort of automate some of that data flow. Um, and, you know, more teams were starting to use BI tools and, and sort of build more real-time dashboards. And we wanted to sort of take that technical requirement away from needing to do that as well. So we started with helping teams in those ways. And now we've sort of expanded the platform to make it a little bit more flexible. Um, you don't have to use, say, for example, the theory of change approach. You can use your own hierarchies and that sort of thing, which we can go through. Okay, so, you know, we're, we're looking to maybe not replace in some areas we would like to, but you know we're talking about online survey tools, teams using spreadsheets, document reports, presentations to build their theories of change, um, or you know teams that can spend a lot of money on purpose-built MISs um, and, and the business intelligence platforms that I mentioned before. So what do we do? So we are an online platform to manage your entire mail process from theory of change development all the way through reporting and stakeholder engagement. Um, as I mentioned before, you can customize your approach to be based on the theory of change approach or log frames or impact models, business plans, anything like that. It even doesn't need to necessarily be um, a specific uh, structure. You can, you can customize it to be really specified for smaller projects within a program, those sorts of things. And really what we want to do was standardize the approach a little bit. So people are using common language. They're going from one program to another. They don't have to understand how this team builds a theory of change. You know, what 
what tools and systems they use, what timelines, timeframes they use, those sorts of things, so that it's a little bit more approachable when you're you're moving between programs as well. Because it's online, everything's real-time collaboration um, and from anywhere where there's an internet connection, it's really low bandwidth. Um, we wanted to make sure that it can be used in Timor-Leste just as well as it does in Brisbane, for example, um, and that it's easy enough for anyone to use. You can be a finance officer, you can be a mail consultant, you can be a, you know, a investment manager in a, in a donor and you'll be able to use it without any of the sort of technical skills you might need for BI tools or, or those sorts of things. We're really hoping with Torch to break down some of those data silos, getting rid of some of these really large Excel documents and, and stuff that sit on people's hard drives and, and sort of have data gatekeepers. We want to make sure that everyone sort of has access to the data that they need. Um, and, and that comes down also to the evaluation process, reducing the work needed to transpose data from one data set to another or, or to put it into a report that then goes to another team that they then take that data down into their own data sets for use, all those sort of things. And also improving the relationship between that quantitative and qualitative data as well. When we talk about quant data where there's trends over time, how do we attach qualitative context to that so that when we're doing reports later on, we already have that information in one place. So here's an example of how we sort of start to think about the structure of say our theories of change. You can customize it, take different layers out, put new ones in, include instruction sets that can be used in the wizard, which I'll show later on, and assign those different hierarchy levels color code so that in the diagrams that we automatically generate, they're sort of themed to how you would expect your theory of change to look. We have a number of indicator types, and this is really how the basis of Torch functions. It's built around your project and your theory of change, and then your indicators attached to the different elements directly um, so that any data that flows through the system is already related in the way that you would expect for your theory of change. So you've got your qual and quant indicators, also status indicators, really good for specific activities, and then financial indicators as well, um, which I'll go into a bit more detail later. Um, you know, we make it really easy to define these indicators with all the different data fields that you would expect when you want to report back to clients and stakeholders. You know, if someone else comes into the system and looks at your impact measurement plan, for example, that all the data is, is there ready to go. These indicators can also be assigned to an individual team or user so that when an indicator comes up for needing data capture, they're going to be alerted and notified that that indicator is, is um, coming up in the next month, for example. And that's all customizable so that you can send out those reminders. The way that we link, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but we also have a tagging system within Torch to tag indicators, say as a KPI or a common indicator or, or priority indicators so that you can relate them in different ways to our automated dashboards. You might have multiple projects spread across the region and you wanna have their own project reporting in country and then feeding that data back to a central um, dashboard or, or project, the tags look you. So I was just saying about the disaggregation. So making sure that, you know, people understand what data should be expected at any of these points in time, really make sure that when you go to write reports and those sorts of things, that there aren't big gaps in those data sets or that, um, you know, we haven't thought about the right um, disaggregation groups. So then this is really quick, but once you've got your indicators set up, you then can set targets against those disaggregations and record results. Um, one of the really key parts for us is being able to record results online or via an import. Um, so you can download a template from Talk Team. Sorry about that. It's really testing me today. Um, so I don't know where we got to. Was this slide? Right, Rebecca. 
Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think you just, yep. Yeah, I think you're just about to move on from here actually. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So I was just talking about the certification process. So teams in the field can record results. They can be QA'd centrally. And then only once they've been QA'd and approved, will they appear in any dashboards or reports or anything like that? And this is a really great way to sort of have people, um, on the front line, record those results, and then and then still have that that level of of checks as well. And you know, there's a role based um, security process through the whole platform, so teams can have access to a single project to the whole platform, um, and that can be set up uh, on a on a project by project basis as well. Um, so indicators, uh, so results can be captured qualitatively or quantitatively, obviously. Um, but then we also have the ability to add additional narrative, um, explanatory text, priority information, uh, and ratings to it. This is really good for things like VFM assessments, where you might have a core set of indicators that are tagged with, um, you know, ethics, economy, efficiency, for example, um, sub tags and then go through and rate them based on your criteria or matrix. Um, but it's all attached to the one set of results. So when you go back and look at those, you can see where those ratings came from, why they were there and those sorts of things. Um, and there's different visualization configuration for, for those to pull them separately to your, to your uh, quantitative results. Um, we create a set of diagrams for you automatically, and we also have a diagram generator, that a diagram builder that you can customize it to the way you want to. Um, but really what we want to do here is any changes within the diagram generator automatically filters through to your overall theory of change, your element descriptions, those sorts of things, and vice versa. So where any changes go throughout the system, it's automatically replicated everywhere else. So you don't have to then go, oh, I need to go and update that diagram or now I need to make sure my impact measurement plan is up to date. It, it's all it's all within the one system. And this is a really good way to do project health um, checks as well. You can use the overview diagram and we overlay status markers across each of the different elements so that you can see where activities or outputs might be falling behind, they might be at risk, et cetera, and have those conversations with stakeholders um, using that as a, as a basis. Uh, this is just the diagram generator I was mentioning before. The overview obviously doesn't show any attribution or contribution, but then when you jump into the actual um, diagram editor, you can also then adjust it, uh, any of the attributions or see them and, and make full changes to the relationship model that way. And this is really important for things like the financial indicators. Um, anywhere within your theory of change or your approach, you can look at a specific element and see which financial indicators are contributing to those and have those financial results flow up so that you can see your impact metrics against your financial um, results. The impact insights, um, this is the dashboarding system. So this is at the project level. We also have a tenant level one as well. Um, and this is really where you start to customize some of these visualizations. So you can see here, as an example, we have a VFM dashboard that's pulling results from um, a specific project and showing them in the gauges and then showing that over time. And that's fully customizable. Um, and what we do here is we use standard Mel terminology to build these out. We don't talk about, you know, rows in a database or X and Y um, values for say line graphs, et cetera, really what we're doing is just saying which data sets, which indicators and disaggregations do I want to display and which visualization do I want to use for from start to finish date? And it will do the rest. It's going to go out and, and um, build those out for you. So the other part of this is the automatic drill down. So when you build out a card in any of our dashboards, you automatically also get um, drill down. So you can click on one, you can see then it's going to show it by, this is a, a card of four different projects contributing to a single common indicator. And you can see which projects are contributing which amounts, by what percentage, um, by disaggregation category, and by 
disaggregation type. So you can see sort of where you might be missing data, where you know certain groups are misrepresented, et cetera. And then you can drill through further into the um, actual detailed results as well to see what the actual values are um, overall. Um, so then, you know, other parts of the system that we haven't really covered is document management. So you can upload documents as evidence to any results or to the project ex itself. This is really good for con con uh, collaborating with evaluators and that sort of thing where you want to put like the annual plan, the annual report together for a project. They might not be a member of the team specifically, but they can see the torch documentation that you've put in there. Um, if you want and for that QA process for results, you can update, upload any survey results or any of that sort of stuff um, as, as backing evidence for that. Um, we talked about the user access controls. Um, we also have version controls and variation support. So you can go in and create a new variation of a project, model it out, see how it's going to work, and then present that back to stakeholders. Uh, and then choose one of those variations or forecasts as your new core project. And this is really good for showing the evolution of a project from start to finish. A program might go for eight, 10 years. How do we see the evolution over time through the theory of change and, and through the approach? Um, we've got project templates built in. So we have our own set based on theory of change approach Um uh, etc., um, which you can use, or you can create your own organizational templates. Um, so if you have lots of smaller programs with, you know, cut down theories of change, you could build a template and then just reuse it over and over. Um, we've got survey tools. Um, so you can build a survey with your disaggregation details, and then um, the system on an ongoing basis can automatically aggregate and record results for those disaggregations over time. So you can imagine, um, you know, uh, an end of program survey or, or, or initiative survey goes out and every quarter we'll just capture those results against those disaggregation sets. And um, the good thing about that as well is anytime you change a disaggregation set in Torch, it's automatically going to update your surveys. So you don't have to then go, oh, we added stuff into the impact measurement plan. We need to now go and update all of our surveys. Uh, it will do that automatically automatically for you. So just two quick case studies to put this into a little bit of context. So this first one was a uh, was a volunteer program. Um, and what they wanted to do was run a VFM assessment across their existing indicator set. So the team went in and either tagged a set of indicators with the relevant VFM um, categories or added a few extras as needed and then went through the existing results and scored them based on their um, criteria matrix and straight away was able to then um, you know visualize those in the dashboard. Um, so that was really a quick way for them to do that whether than, rather than having to go and reinvent the theory of change again for the VFM assessment and, and do it all again from scratch. The second one uh, is a private sector program um, that's tracking multiple uh, interventions individually. They have their own business plans built in to Torch as their own project. Their partners then record results on an ongoing basis and then they're QA centrally and then aggregated and reported um, with key indicators. So some programs, some projects have their own indicator set, but then they're sort of uh, translated through Torch into a set of common common indicators. And the, the key outcome for this was that it really reduced the time it took them to do any reporting because it was monitored on an ongoing basis when they went to do the reports. All that data was already QA'd. It was already in one place. They could just go and grab those visualizations, put them into the report and include the context, the contextual narrative with any of those changes. So this is just a bit of a sneak peek of what's next. So we want to take that impact measurement plan, which is automatically generated and builds the work plans as well. So each team will be able to see, you know, visually what data needs to be captured when and if it's overdue. Um, 
we're looking to do more data capture integrations with financial systems and those sorts of things so that data can be automatically pulled through into those indicators. Um, more detailed reporting, um, which we haven't shown today. Um, GIS visualizations this is another big one. How do we take that disaggregated data and visualize it for GIS? Um, project benchmarking and lessons learned and recommendations. So the more data we have for programs, the more we'll be able to say, you know, for similar programs with standard, with similar goal statements or impact statements, how can we sort of share some of those lessons learned with teams that are spending more money in certain activities, but not seeing as good results potentially, um, and, and sort of start to fine tune some of those approaches or, or help, um, guide some of those those impact outcomes. Um, evaluative questions, it's an area where we haven't really looked at yet. How do we best take those evaluative questions every year and, and give a compelling way to, to put them together? Um, and also improve our survey system so that you can send um, the same surveys to the same participants on an ongoing basis, track if they've actually recorded them and, and, and reported back so that you can see you know, the same survey filled out over and over and then what those results look like over time for longitudinal studies and stuff. Um, and then we're also developing at the moment an organizational or, do or donor level platform, which will uh, connect to multiple torch tenants and enable you to aggregate data up from there. So each project can be its own uh ecosystem or environment, but then pull that up for more portfolio or country level reporting on common indicators at the organizational level. Okay, uh, I think that's everything that I wanted to go through. So if we have any questions. Thank you so much, Luke. That was that was great. And um, and well done going through the Wi-Fi difficulties as well. Like a pro, you knew exactly how to ride that out. Um, and um, I don't think we've got any questions in the in the chat. So what I might do is invite um, um, Sarah, um, Josh, um, um, to join us back um, with Luke. Um, and Luke, if I could maybe um, just ask you to stop sharing your your screen um, and just open the floor to um, to any other questions. Um, if you do have a, a question, please feel free to put your hand up, um, and I will try and and see you. Um, or else you can put another question in the chat if you have anything else for, for, for the speakers. Um, just while we're waiting, people to, to think of um, think of any questions. Um, just some great feedback there, Luke, from from David for you. Just you know, a really comprehensive solution, and and um, I think for for the techie evaluators, um, you can see a lot of us getting into the detail there um, as as well. Which I'm sure, I'm sure David David loves it too. Um, so um look if um if there are any other other questions um I'd just like to um to extend a thank you from from Sarah and AS to um to Sarah um to to Luke and and Josh um as well as Sarah, Sarah's Sarah's colleague um as well um who uh, who who's Mel I'm sorry I just forgot your name there for a sec Mel <laughs> but um thank you very much for presenting your different solutions today um. Um, you know, there's a lot of obviously a lot of interest from from the um, the members of Simna and AES and and the non-members as well who have who have joined us today. Um, I'll just double check. There's no other questions. Oh, there are some. Great. Um, um, just a question from Rose to everybody. Thanks, thanks, Rose. Um, did any of you involve end users, service recipients in the design of your platforms? Um, if so, did their thoughts differ from other stakeholders? Um, so Luke, can I maybe invite you to? to answer that, sure. that question. Yep. Yeah, I mean, we work with um, end users every day to fine tune the requirements and reporting and data flow and all those sorts of things. Um, I think across the different donors, definitely their requirements differ a little bit. And that's where we sort of had to fine tune our customizations and approach. Um, but, you know, throughout our whole process from designing a feature all the way through to deployment and QA, we're always getting feedback from our current our current um, users to make sure that any design briefs are, you know, representative of what they're actually asking for, you know, will it work in the context they work with and, and how do we fine tune that um, to make sure that any improvements do fit the vast majority. Sometimes they're not going to. And in those cases, we have made customization specific for those deployments. Um, but 
yeah, I mean, it, yeah, the idea is to make it as low cost for teams as possible. So we try and make sure that we're improving it for everyone um, for those requirements at the same time. Right, thanks, Luke. And, and Josh, did you want to comment at all in terms of the involvement of um, particularly, you know, the end users um, or service recipients in your, your platform? Yeah, so if, if you're referring to service recipients as in, say, the beneficiaries that in our case would probably sit more under a charity or organisation, <clears throat> then... Yes, we've got further designs around finance and banking. So if you imagine that some of our nonprofits that we work with are international aid, they'll work in countries abroad where they may not have banking or, or great financial infrastructure. So we've been designing around that. Um, but it can be a little bit challenging. We sit at the top sector level and then you've got different, I guess, service beneficiaries under each uh, segment or industry under the whole sector but I, if you're not doing that and you're not designing around that I think you're probably not doing your job properly <laughs> yeah it's so key isn't it Josh Definitely. Um, and I think we've just got uh, and Sarah has of course answered the question in, in the in the chat was there anything else you wanted to mention on that Sarah live are you happy to um Mel I think perhaps you wanted to start in terms of answering Oh, yeah, I was just going to say I, I was the customer first. Um, so I was one of the early customers of Folktale a couple of years ago and we piloted it in a um, COVID response setting across six different countries. Um, and I guess while I have while ended up staying, coming into the fold later down the track is um, we were doing quarterly, uh, sorry, fortnightly Zoom check-ins with participants, but all learning it together um, and a number of feedback that came direct has now now exists in the um in folktale so um i have really appreciated the learning posture and developing it to really be participant-led genuinely um so valley's alignment was really key and why i probably ended up a few years later here <laughs> trying to translate <laughs> it to different organizations as somebody who had to go through that yeah and then more broadly, because, you know, similar to the other um, applications, we are product led, right, in terms of understanding all of the key priorities. So it's really important Like we've got some really incredible champions, um, customers that we work with. And depending on which type of role you play, um, we're constantly getting feedback from all of them. And, you know, it's the emergence of Folktill Academy that was because of um, contributors that were getting trained on Folktale. And after 12 months of working together, they were so proud. They said, can we actually print out some certificates to say that we know Folktale now, like we know Excel or Canva or PowerPoint. And we're like, hey, actually, we need to probably make an academy around this. So that was really led by the um, folks that we work with amongst many other parts of the platform. That's a great example, Sarah. Um, well, um, we might close it there. So um, I always say that Queensland's the best state for social impact measurement. Um, and of course, we've got the best impact measurement tools and platforms as well. Um, so, um, and um, uh, so thank you again, Luke, Josh, and, and Sarah. And, um, and thank you for those of you that have joined us.